right, I am here with a host, a television personality. You probably recognize him from RuPaul's Drag Race. Jason Carter, thank you so much for taking time to meet up with me during your busy uh, day here in New York. I appreciate Hi. it. Hello, my pleasure, uh, Brian. Pleasure to be here with you. Pleasure to meet you. And yeah, it's been uh, New York is always the most. <laughs> for real, it's the most. So let's uh, delve deep into your life here. Sure. When did you first decide you wanted to be in the entertainment industry for I, an actual career? Uh, when I, I first decided that I wanted to be in entertainment when I was seven, because I was a dancer before, so mm -hmm. I got into entertainment. My mom used to take me to dance class when I was six or seven. I have a twin brother, so me and my twin brother, my twin brother didn't do it. He was more into sports, but I was terrible at sports. So my mom was like, oh, let's put him into dancing. So um, I just did that, and from there I just stuck with it, and one thing led to another, and it just became, I think, as I got older, like in my teen years and stuff, I realized that it was something that was so like intrinsic to who I was, who might be, who I, who I was at the at my core. Yeah. So I just stuck with it, and you know, it put me on this path of to where I am now. Are, are identical twins? I have a fraternal twin. Fraternal. Brother. Fraternal. I was gonna say we gotta test that out. If it's identical, <laughs> and I'll like punch you and see if he feels it. No, or, I know he won't. No. No, he fraternal. won't feel it. No. All right, then I will save my violence for the next time I interview. <laughs> actual twins <laughs> so you said you started off uh, with dance mm -hmm. was that something you wanted to pursue professionally or did you feel that that was something that you may not have I did pursue it professionally you did pursue it professionally. I did pursue it professionally yeah I moved so I, I started dancing when I was seven like I said mm -hmm. um, started choreographing professionally when I was 15 and then um, back in, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, so I, my, it's really interesting how dance and television collide on mm -hmm. um, the very intersectional in my life because um, I got my first hosting gig at the age of 16 on a local dance show back in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And with this dance show, I had to dance. So from there, it gave me the opportunity to not only hone my, my, ho my on-camera chops, which were terrible back then, <laughs> but... You know, just, <clears throat> I and we had to do like weekly routines and we had a, like a dance group that would perform. And so I I was pretty much the choreographer for that mm -hmm. at 16 and it stuck with that all through high school. And then when I was 21, I actually had my first big audition here and well in Los Angeles was for Janet Jackson. Mm -hmm. It was for the Janet Jackson All For You tour. Okay. And so, I mean, from, from there I had been auditioning, flying back and forth to LA. You know, you do the whole audition, nothing happens. You mm -hmm. go out, nothing happens. Spend a lot of money flying to New York, um, LA, nothing happens. And then so uh, in, the, in the spring of 2002, I decided to move to Los Angeles. And so um, that was, yeah, that was a, the most uh, crap show in itself. But it was, <laughs> but it, when I say that, because it was just, you know, going from Albuquerque, New Mexico, yeah. which when you're 20, you don't have much to come into Los Angeles. It's a, it's a huge right. move, and you know? It could be a scary town. Oh, it was super scary. that young. So scary. Mm -hmm. But I look back on it now and think, like, I'm so glad I did that because I moved back home after my tumultuous year in Los Angeles for like three years and then came back and you know knew what to do, had my, all my ducks in a row. And from there I got to dance with like Kelly Clarkson, I got to be in Lady Gaga videos, mm -hmm. got a really, really cool agent. So it just um, was what I needed to do in order to, to get to where I was trying to go. And in that time, um, I, in that time I will from, okay, let me go back from 1999 to 2005, I worked in radio, mm -hmm. I was a radio jockey. So I worked, I did work in every format, top 40, CTR rhythmic, talk, news, did it all. So that also was um, really cool because I got to see the inner, inner workings of a lot of the entertainment business through radio and Absolutely. how things work yeah. and how to maneuver and manage all of that because this business is a very, I hate to use the word cutthroat because I mean, life is cutthroat, right? True, very like true. Life, everything's competitive. There's, there's varying degrees of competition. Mm -hmm. So but you, you, you learn how to, how to manage people and how to personalities. And when you're, when you're from a, a place like Albuquerque, New Mexico, you don't have those opportunities and, or have those chances to meet different types of people because it's a small town. Right. Pretty much everyone's the same. You need a New York or yeah. LA experience. Right, that. exactly. Chicago, that kind of thing. Yeah, a bigger city. So, so just, it was this amalgamation of just these different things in my life that, that now again, like Brian, looking back and it's just, it's like fate and destiny, I guess, mm -hmm. but you don't, 
hindsight's twenty twenty, so you don't of you course. don't realize that. And even even when you're present in it, like currently, mm-hmm. in this moment, you still think like, wow, that yeah, it's that that's saying that um, what you go through is preparing for everything you ask for. Yeah, so true. It is true. It is so very true. true. When you were working at the radio stations, did you think that you would like to stay into that, or did you know that you were gonna kind of pop off into hosting? That must have been a good training ground. Because you're somewhat of a host, DJing and stuff. Yeah. Or not DJing, but you know. Sure, no, yeah, DJing. Well, yeah. that's, yeah, you're radio jockey, yeah. DJ. It's all, it's all the same, same thing. thing. That's yeah. a great question. You know what? Yes, because from, I got into radio from being on television. Mm-hmm. So I was cutting a commercial for this TV show, mm-hmm. and someone walked by in, in, in the hallway and was like, like, bust through the door and was like, hey, do you want to be on the radio? And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm serious. He's like, you have a great voice. You should be on the radio. Have you done that before? It's like, no, but I mean, I'm down. I mean, I, I was that kid that was just like, yes, 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 yeah. yes. Got me in a lot of trouble. Well, but I, well yeah. but, but it's also helpful. Right. And he didn't say you have the face for radio. Right. So could, that was, there was no double-edged compliment. Right. He could have been like, you know, you have a you face have, for <laughs> radio. But, um, so I, the program director, his name is Tom Naylor. Mm-hmm. Never forget the guy. He now is the program director for, I think, WQ93 in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Really cool guy. And he said, be back here at midnight. Because, you know, they put you on overnight in of case, course, you, case yeah, you're yeah, terrible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I did that for three months, just of Saturdays and Sundays overnight. And then the summer came, and he said, hey, I want to move you to, to afternoons on the weekends. You do the weekend, the weekend shift, which was so cool because yeah, yeah, yeah. you're in the summer. Yep. And, you know, the, and then back then, the, I mean, the music is great now, but the music was so wonderful back then. And it was just, you know, this opportunity. In a small town where everyone knows you, they mm-hmm. already know you for being on television, and oh my gosh, now you're on the radio. Right. And everyone knows your voice, and it was just cool. And I got and I got to I learned how to produce, I learned how to how to how to connect with people because, mm-hmm. like you said, people can't see your face; all they see is your voice. You have know, people calling in, and also being from Albuquerque, I was very I was aware of the different areas and you know the type what type the, the types of people that dwell in different neighborhoods. Right. So you just you you're, you grow custom and you you attribute your performance to those. Um, those, I guess, different sectors of the city, but yeah, it was definitely great, a great training because, again, had I not had that experience, it wouldn't have given me the confidence, the confidence to be, I guess, a public speaker. I think people have anxiety about public speaking, mm-hmm. and it's one thing to be in front of someone and have a conversation, but it's quite another to just have your voice tell a story. Right. And so, and and you would think it'd be the other way around that people would be like, oh, I don't, no one can see me, my, but I was more, it was more daunting for me to be a radio jockey right. than it was to be. A host on, on television. Mm-hmm. I know, so, so random, so weird. Now, when you, how did you get involved with RuPaul's Drag Race? I got involved with RuPaul's Drag Race. It's a really cool story. So, spring of 2010, I was on this whole, I had just got out of a really bad like relationship. I was just, you know, in Los Angeles, you know, late 20s, and was still doing the dance thing. So I, I, had, I was still t- auditioning, so I was teaching a dance class in Hollywood, at the Gold's Gym in Hollywood. At this Gold's Gym, in the studio, it's all glass. So you have this dance studio, and there's people on ellipticals that you can see into this. It's really, it's really cool. Well, one of the producers of the show was on the elliptical, watching me teach his dance class. His friend was in the class. So after, the friend comes up to me and says, hey, have you thought about doing television? We're looking for models for this TV show. I can't tell you what it is, mm-hmm. but it's really cool. Do you have pictures? I had just did a new photo shoot that January. It was really cool, like body shots. And I've been working out a lot. It was really cool. So yeah, of course I had pictures. But I thought this sounds kind of casting couch situation. I was I was that way. You literally fed yeah, my next question. Yeah, it was, like, and it wasn't. But I'll get to that. And so <laughs> I, of course, I passed along my information to said producer. Mm-hmm. And then, this was like probably February of 2010. Didn't hear anything. A couple of weeks later, I was hosting an event at a really, at a very prestigious club in Los Angeles with Shangela, mm-hmm. who would be competing again on season three, which was my first season. I was eliminated in season two, mm-hmm. brought her back, right? At this, at this event, those, that producer and two other producers were there. And so, they were like, oh my gosh, that's the guy. So I had, I, this was unbeknownst to me. That was a Wednesday. That Saturday, I attend a pool party, and guess who's at this party? 
those producers again. It was very weird. Yeah. So, so either they're stalking you or Or it's fate. fate, right. <laughs> so for weeks, I had been getting emails from the production company like, hey, you know, can you come in for an audition? Timing never worked up. Timing never timing worked out or lined up. Mm -hmm. Final day. I get It was a Wednesday. I'll never forget. It was a Wednesday. And I get another email from production. Hey, you need to come in today. I thought, what the hell? Let me go in today. Can you bring a, Can you bring two pairs of underwear? I'm like, Ugh, why? Right. <laughs> You were worried you were going to go to the yeah. bathroom or something on yourself. Right. So at this point, I had gotten, I had sussed that, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a reality show. They were looking for models, mm -hmm. underwear, okay, whatever. Nothing big deal. So I go, and World of Wonder, who produces Drag Race, they own this huge, beautiful building on the corner of Cherokee and Hollywood Boulevard in L.A. Downstairs in the basement is a big studio. Mm -hmm. So back then, almost 10 years ago, it was just a green screen. And they put me on a box. and like, hey, dance. I was just like... Well, I'm a professional dancer, so did my, right. my go-go dancing, like, you gotta be more specific. Right. Just dance. Fine, danced, nothing. Didn't hear anything, left, thought, okay, that was it. Two months pass, and I'm at, it's, I think it's Father's Day? Yeah, May, yeah, no, that was April, sorry. It's June, mm -hmm. I'm, at a, I'm at a lunch, I'm at a Father's Day brunch with this guy, I'm a psychic, an alleged psychic. <laughs> claims, reported claims of her being a psychic. <laughs> and. We're, just, we're talking and she asked me a question. She's like, hey, did you just like, are you in college? Are you testing for something? Are you like going out for, are you, are you waiting for an answer? And I was like, scratching my nose, I have really bad allergies. And she's like, yeah, you're gonna get it. It's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be life changing for you. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be awesome. She saw some guy with, I, I, I can't tell his name, but it's, he has an F in his name. You're gonna get a call from a guy named, well, you're gonna hear from a guy with an F in his name. She was super passionate about this brand. So that was Sunday. Friday, I get a call from Frank from World of Wonder asking me if I want to be on the next season of RuPaul's Drag Race. That's crazy. And then when, yeah, it was out of control and I thought, sure. So my first day on set, fast forward, I meet Ru, and Ru's like, I saw your picture and it was you. Like out of all the, out of all the people we saw, I had to, it was you, you were the one, you, you, you popped the most. There's something about you, you had this spark about you. That's awesome. It was really cool. So, and I mean, Brian, looking back, Words cannot articulate or I can't describe how, like, this, it's, cha it's changed my life, literally. Mm -hmm. Literally. And just being able to be a part of history, because Drag Race is this global phenomenon, mm -hmm. and it is a part of television history. You know, we're in it right now. We're, we're in it, we're, we're experiencing it, much like we experienced Friends, or we experienced all the, you know, Breaking yeah, Bad. exactly the same. When you move from that, when Drag Race isn't around anymore, or when we, or when we evolve from Drag Race, or whatever, whatever that evolution is, we will look back on a show that hadn't seen it, that was th that there was nothing like it before, mm -hmm. and what it's done for for not only LGBTQ plus but just bringing people together via gay, straight, black, mm -hmm. cisgendered, you know, gender um, non-binary, it's it's immense, and I and I and I'm a part of that. Yeah, you know, it's extremely important. It's extremely important, and I think you know it's also interesting how I really didn't have a education on LGBTQ plus culture until Drag Race because I was, I grew up, like I said, in Albuquerque. There wasn't a huge gay community. I wasn't out in Albuquerque growing up because I couldn't be. Right. So now it's just the indoctrination I've had of just LGBTQ plus and just people in general. It's that's that in itself is so powerful and monumental, you know? Yeah. Have you ever had people, given <coughs> the nature of what you did on Drag Race, do you have people coming up thinking that they can, like, either say things that are inappropriate, always, or, or like, oh, lift your shirt, I want to feel that, like, and how do you deal with stuff like that? You know, you, I think as I've done this show and as time's gone on, I have been able to compartmentalize, you know, those fans and what I do now because. I was a lot younger then, so of course, mm -hmm. like, yeah, cool. But as you get older, you realize that you know there, there, it's just you're, there's more. I think I got tired of just being seen as a body, mm -hmm. and I want, and I was always more. Right. I was always more. I always had more to offer. Just Drag Race was. I was there was this this one myopic view of who I was. I was ornamental and not functional, and so people, I, my my product, my purpose on the show was to be this, right? Mm -hmm. So when people would come up to me and. You know, no one was ever really inappropriate. 
But you know, of course, with social media, especially as on the upswing of social media in the last ten years, people say things like, or case in point, it was in Houston one year for Pride, which Houston Pride's amazing, and this guy was with Willem from season four, and we were we were doing a meet and greet, and he was just like, "Oh, you're just a dude, a dude in underwear. You you have no substance." Or he's like, "You're you're you're no one. You just stand around in your underwear all day." Or he's like, "Can I touch you?" And I was like, "No." And he was like, "Well, why not? I mean, this is what you do. It's your job." You know, and I would I blew it off. It's like whatever because these are I, I get why they think that, and I have to be I have to be able to let that go. You know, because it's not nothing personal, and no one's ever been super handy or super or, or violent or aggressive. That's never I've never run into that situation before ever. I think if they saw your body on drag race, it would probably be stupid <laughs> to go uh, to try and physically assault you. You'd be surprised. People are crazy, man. That, that's true. This is America in 2019. You have For no sure. idea what could happen. I know. Um, so you're now working on ET now. ET Live. ET Live. Sorry. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? So hosting, uh, my hosting career has been for the last 20 years. I and when I was in Los Angeles, I just did. A, you know, I made a, a career in hosting from from crumbs, right? I took all the crumbs and made a loaf of bread for my hosting career because that's what you have to do until you get an awesome, awesome opportunity. I started working for a bunch of different outlets like After Buzz TV and mm -hmm. just, just, you know, just different places because I, this is something I really wanted to do. And then in the summer of 2016, I got um, asked to be part of a the largest online YouTube news show in the world, The Young Turks. Right. So they're super political, amazing. Samantha Shocker, who is now on Daily Blast Live. She's been on CNN. Awesome chick. She gave me a really good opportunity. I was at home one day doing webisodes, and YouTube recommended this show called Pop Trigger. And I love Sam. We had tested for a bunch of shows on different networks together. And so I tweeted her and was like, hey, I love your show. Do you remember me? I would love to, you know, come on and check it out. She's like, why don't you be a guest on my show? Come, come. Can you come tomorrow, as a matter of fact? You know, so did that and just kept coming back until they just kept me. You know, like, mm -hmm. hey, you should just work here. So last August, August of 2018, no, July of 2018, TYT canceled all entertainment programming. So essentially nothing I did there would exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And in our final week there, I, I had got an invitation through Instagram from a, from an, from, I think it was a, I don't know who's a, a, a talent, an executive at CBS Interactive who owns ET Live and was in my DMs and said, hey, I'm so-and-so, we like you, mm -hmm. um, who reps you? And I was like, no one reps me. Mind you, I just fired my manager the week, that Monday. It's the universe, I'm telling you, Brian, the yeah. universe. <laughs> and so he's like, hey, what's your email? Email them. Email me, we started talking. And then an hour later, I was talking to like a senior VP at CBS. Wow. Isn't social media just like incredible these days? It, incredible. And what's incredible as well, Brian, is that I don't keep the in Instagram app on my phone because mm -hmm. I am like, I'll be there all day scrolling. So that day, I just happened to have it on my phone. And I was sitting in a chair like this, getting ready to film at TYT. And also, mm -hmm. I'm just like, okay, I'm sure. It, and, you know, again, you get, you, got, you get a lot of requests on social media. Like, can you come do this? And so that, that was a Thursday. Friday, I, go, I went to CVS and met with everybody. They screen tested me and then nothing. Sunday night, they emails me again. Hey, can you come in tomorrow? We want to test you with somebody else. So great. Did that, nothing. Went to Europe for two weeks after that. That, yeah. And just thought, like every audition you go to, you go in, don't hear anything, nice to meet you. And I even, even, I even said, I even said to the producers, if I never see you again, thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Because that's just how it goes. Like, you, you, you just don't know. Right. So I was in Europe for two weeks, and the, it was nail in the coffin. I was done at TYT, jobless jobless and so I thought hey I'm gonna come out to LA mm -hmm. and just be a regular person I'm in the Sistine Chapel I turn on my phone because we had been at sea it was a cruise so of course you know there's no service or I, I right. saw let me just enjoy this vacation I'm in the Sistine Chapel turn on my phone all of a sudden I have all these like emails and messages from CBS like hey you need to give us a call mm -hmm. we're trying to get a hold of you we see you're on vacation your Instagram looks amazing call us call yeah, us yeah. call us call us call us call us call <laughs> and so I call and so I finally I got in touch with whoever was trying to get a hold of me her name was Daria Daria Murray and she's like hey we you know we want to bring you on board what do you, how do you think what do you think and I was like 
Let's do it. Well, nah, I, I don't really feel like. It. like mm, nah, <laughs> let get me get back, back to, to you. Yeah, yeah, no. I'll get back to you when I feel like answering. You. That's awesome. Yeah. So now that you're hosting, you've had a ton of practice. Obviously, you've mm. been doing it for a long time. Sure. How do you handle interviewers who either a aren't interested, or aren't paying attention, or that kind of thing? I think it goes. I, you know, luckily, that's a great question. Luckily, I haven't had that. Ever, I mean, a good, a good interview, a good interviewer mm -hmm. always listens, right? Mm -hmm. Because one, I do my homework. Like if I'm interviewing you, Brian, I'm gonna know why you have all your tattoos. I'm gonna know where you're from. I'm gonna know things about you because I think there's something to be said about connecting with person on the uh, with the person on the level that's not just about like fluff. Case in point. Rob Markman works at a place called Genius. It's just, it's an amazing online music and just pop culture, urban culture platform. I'm a huge Mariah Carey fan, huge fan. He last November interviewed her and it was probably the best interview because he talked to her about things that were interesting to her, her being a songwriter. Mm -hmm. Not the diva Mariah, not the antics of Mariah Carey, but why we came to love her. And it was one of the most compelling hours of my life. I watched it four times and probably cried all four. Mm -hmm. So when you when you have people who aren't interested or who who are a tough interview, all you can do is just listen and ask the questions and know that you you can ask the question. They don't have to answer it. If they don't answer it, you move on to the next thing because you can't control how good an interview is. Right. I can't control if someone's gonna give me something. Right. And if I'm genuinely interested in them and if I'm genuinely trying to connect with them in a way that's not aggressive or that's not pushy sometimes you have to push depending right. on depending on the sound you want right then then it's cool you know there's been times where i've interviewed people that were like that's you you say you're going to give me an exclusive and that's it really so right. you, but you just have to be present and just go with it mm -hmm. that's all you can do really so, and i think that makes better interviews too is when you are paying attention or you do know a small little detail you can yeah. flip in and then that could open the conversation people and, love talking about themselves yeah and that uh, leads them to be more comfortable and maybe they will tell you something oh yeah else. justin Thoreau, last year at um the afi film festival he loves dogs mm -hmm. he's voicing the he is tramp in the live action lady in the tramp mm -hmm. he has a dog named kuma mm -hmm. i i knew justin loved dogs so i was like justin are we gonna get your dog kuma in this movie oh, i i swear his head was gonna pop off because yeah. he's like yeah how do you know that I'm like well i mean you're Justin Thoreau, you know, I'm a huge fan. He's like, yeah, dude, we're gonna get in the movie, it's gonna be great. Yeah, like super excited that I know about his dog. And yeah. that's because people want, they, they, especially stars, they are so used to just the headlines or just, you know, how do you right, feel right. this movie? Oh my gosh, when so good to see you. When did talk to Jen last? It's right. like enough No, it's different. like, how are you doing, man? Like, what's yeah. going on? What's going on in your world, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's all you can do really is just being present and listening. That definitely opens them up. A lot quicker when you mm -hmm. don't go for the the, 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 the low hanging asks. fruit. The low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. the same things everybody asks. Right. Them. Yeah. Is there someone? Uh, I'm sure there's probably more than one, but who'd be your top person that you want to interview? Uh, top person. I was asked this question. Um, top person I would love to interview. I would. I would have to be one Mariah Carey, and I, mm -hmm. people laugh at me when I say that. They think oh, he's so predictable. He's so basic. But to, <laughs> no. And the reason why I say that I, her is because this is someone. Music is so important to me. Music is music is super. I, I mean, I can't. There are no words to describe how important music is to me, but just that music is so important to me. And she is someone that has been a part of my musical story, and the soundtrack to my life for since I can remember, since 1990. Mm -hmm. And so I have in every every chapter of my life, every stage of my life, there has been a Mariah Carey album or song or something. I know I sound like a, like a 16 year old girl, but it's deeper than that because she is brilliant and just her vocabulary, how she writes songs, who she is. I think that she, sitting down with her and just picking her brain about just music in general and how in the correlation with her life and, and who she is and the life she's led being who she is and strip away all like, just the superfluous bullshit. Yeah. And just get to the person that would be so immensely gratifying and mm -hmm. awesome that I don't know. I mean, I could die happy, man. I would love to talk to, I would love to sit down and talk to Trump. Because I think, and I say, and I say, I would love to sit down and talk to Trump because I think 
he has yet to give an interview to anyone to discuss, to, to talk about who he is in this space right now. We know for a fact that things are in our country are a little are a little awry. And, I mean, <laughs> a very diplomatic way to put right. it. Right. Well, it's the truth, though. They, they are. are. I mean, because yeah. there's some people who disagree. You know, it's it, there's two sides to every story, right? right? My opinion, I can't, I can't speak for everyone. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for the for the right. But I would love to sit down and talk to him and and get to the bottom of who he is because we want understanding. I think now more than anything, we want understanding for what's going on. And who better to get understanding from than the horse's mouth if they relinquish that information, right? I was going to say that would be a tough nut to crack. Right, that, it would yeah. be a tough nut to crack, but I think that just it would be fascinating to be like, dude, are you aware? How have we come to this? Mm -hmm. Why? How, you know, those are the questions we want to answer because late night talk show, sketch shows, people are, we're, we're always asking these questions when I go straight to the source, but yet we haven't had that opportunity for some reason. Yeah. It's really weird mm -hmm. how a Barbara Walters and Oprah, Diane Sawyer, no one sat, has sat down with POTUS and been like, dude, let's, let's, let's check unpack this out. some shit. Yeah. Right, so, and then, um, you know, to anyone that's interesting, I think we put so much, so much, I don't know, we give so much weight to celebrities mm -hmm. and stars and people who are, who are, that do a job, and we think they're so important because they put out albums or mm -hmm. they make movies, but how are they any more important than what you're doing? Right. They're not, you know, they're not more important. They just so happen to be in a space that allows them to appeal to more, to more people, but you get up every day, you put your pants on, one, two legs at one leg at a time, mm -hmm. you, you bleed, you cry, you hurt, you're happy, you know, you, you, you brave New York traffic to be here to connect with me, how is that any less important than than what a star is doing? It's not. I agree with you 100%. You no? Know? Yeah. Would you like to host your own like daytime talk show? I would love to host my own daytime talk show. I think that that would be the... For me to host my own daytime talk show, I think that's where I'm headed. I think that's where I'm going. That's mm -hmm. what's going to happen. And I have watched... I've grown up watching daytime talk shows. I'm reading a book called The Ladies Who Punch right now. It's about The View. Hey, I read it. It's, it's the best read. Crazy, right? Crazy, right? The Rosie fastest Dude, read ever. I know. Read. It's like I burned through that so quick. I couldn't get through it fast. No, enough. the Rosie O'Donnell chapter is the best. Yeah. That's a whole other video. <laughs> but um, I, I grew, book. yeah, I grew up watching Ginny Jones, Maury, Ricky, mm -hmm. GMA, Today Show. I mean, I grew. I mean, I was raised on great daytime television. I don't think I think that we've pivoted from that because we have digital now. We have so many other avenues to yeah. experience <clears throat> news, which is a blessing and a curse, I guess. Right, because you know we're we're instantaneously getting what we need, yeah. if you will. But then we're also so disconnected. But there's nothing like coming home, boom, snack, Ricky Lake, boom, four p.m. Oprah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, agree with. I, you. I mean, I there I have I had Oprah episodes recorded because I was that big of a fan. I think daytime television is missing a a light. You know, RuPaul has his show coming out, mm -hmm. a limited run in June. I think that's gonna be a great space and it's gonna be a great opportunity, a great vehicle for that light to come back to daytime television because Oprah's gone, Harry Connick Jr. is gone, and a lot of people, and I loved his show, and a lot of people who were successful in that space don't want to come back to that, and a lot of people who tried to be successful in that space are no longer around. Right. So it's like, what do we have? You know, what, what do we have? So I think that, you know, everything that I've been through as a host and what I'm learning, because even at ET Now, mm -hmm. ET Now, ET Live, ET, See? ET Now, <laughs> ET Now. Is, You'll now be fired because I am now trans. No, ET Now is our online, is, is our Twitter handle. Um, <clears throat> even at ET Live, though, you know, there's, it's challenging because you're, you're never, ever, I believe you never, ever stop growing. I think you should mm -hmm. always, I'm such a perfectionist. I want the best. Like, there's no excuse for mediocrity. You should always want to be, like, amazing, engaging in what you do. And mm -hmm. I think you're always on the precipice of, of trying too hard or actually ac or accomplishing what you're trying to do. It's, it's, it's like that, that mental, that's the battle you have as a creative, especially as mm -hmm. someone who's really passionate about what they do, be it hosting or cooking or anything. You always want to elevate and you always want to evolve. You always want to put your best foot forward. Right. And you don't like, you know, you, you... I liken creatives or people with talent to mutants, right? We have this special something that we turn on and turn off that is so like dear to us and we control it and we we want to share it with the world. We want to we want to harness it and make it yeah. the most potent. 
And that's how I feel about being an on-camera personality is that I want to connect with people and I want to be my best self. <clears throat> I want to be authentic. I want to be funny. I want to be present. Like you, you're always constantly, you know, all these spinning, these spinning plates. Mm -hmm to get to this one definitive sweet spot that really, is there a definitive sw sweet spot? There isn't, yeah. you know? And you definitely have to be present to be a talk show host. Yeah, and there's times where, or you know, and people think it's easy. People oh. think that it's so easy to just get in front of a camera and look pretty and talk. It's not, it's not, it's not. There's so many elements you balance and there's so many things you have to be aware of and mm -hmm. you know, and, and then you and then yourself, the camera exposes you. You're exposed. You yep. can't. You can't. There's no. I wish more on chapstick. There's no um, smoke and mirrors. I guess like it's just you and 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 whoever you're talking. I always say the person I'm talking to down the barrel is her name is Tasha. Mm -hmm. She's 25. She works at Sephora. She's like <laughs> bi biracial. Uh -huh. She's cool. You know, she's snaps off. You know, she she's trendy, but she wants she but she but she's you know she wants the truth. You know, she wants a she's your home girl. That's what I'm always talking to when I'm, when I'm talking, when I'm presenting or when I'm on camera. So sometimes you, you lose sight of Tasha. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And so it's like bringing it all back. It's, it's, it's a lot. But daytime television, I think, is exactly where I'm going to end up eventually. Or I, I will end up on TV eventually. There you go. Um, who knows? Daytime would be great. Mornings <laughs> would be awesome. After as long as it's on TV, so, right? You'll, right. You'll take it. I'll take it, yeah. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time. Of course. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having Probably me. Talk to you for another hour. If we, uh, we say if we, we, we still time, got some time, though. We, we we still got some nah, time. Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. It's been a real pleasure. Brian, my pleasure. Ple the pleasure is all mine. <laughs>